Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Theology Talk, where we explore both our own theology in the restored Church of Jesus Christ and the theology of others. I am your host, Jacob Hansen, and joining me today is my co-host, Hayden Carroll. Hey, everyone. Uh, also joining us today is author and theologian uh, and scholar, Blake Osler. Blake, thanks for coming on. So Blake is uh, the author, most notably, author of more than just this, but of the Exploring Mormon Thought series. Uh, Blake, do you want to just give a brief overview? I think most of our listeners probably have heard of it, but if anyone hasn't, I figured I'd let you kind of introduce that uh, that series. Yeah, I, Exploring Mormon Thought is presently a four-volume series that, that addresses theological issues in Mormonism, compares and contrasts with the historical tradition and theism in general and Christianity. And so the first volume addresses the attributes of God um, the, and the issues that arise from us, from uh, affirming certain kinds of attributes. The second addresses soteriology, which is the theory of salvation. Basically, uh, you know, how is one saved? What does it mean to be saved? What is exaltation? What is theosis? That kind of thing. Um, and deals, deals with some of the real challenges in traditional thought rising from predestination and why predestination is so ubiquitous in traditional Christian thought. The third addresses issues that arise with respect to the Godhead and to theosis, both of God and individuals. And the fourth volume addresses the problem of evil. The fifth volume, which I've had done for some time, I'm now going through and, and updating it essentially, is an epistemology of religious experience and whether a person can properly say, I know, in mm -hmm. relation to spiritual experiences. And the last volume will deal essentially with consciousness and the mind-body problem. Wow. Wow. I'm looking forward to it. Now, that last volume that you mentioned, did you say that that is something that's in the works or is that out? It, no, it's it's in the works. It's it's the issue that I've had the most interest in since I began as an undergrad from the very even while I was in high school. It's the issue I've had the most interest in. I've done the most research in, and it's the one every time I start to write about it, realize that I'm still up in the air about all the possibilities and exactly how to parse them and, and resolve all of them. It's a it's still a conundrum for me. And in particular, I'm looking at the issue of what are life options within Mormonism and whether or not they're the best options overall, even outside of Mormonism. And so um, I'm, I've done an incredible amount of research. I even went so far as to get a degree in uh, psychobiology or neurophysiology and psychology. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, specialize in philosophy of mind and that kind of thing. So... You know, well, I'm 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 really looking forward to that because that is a subject that that I'm very interested in myself. So when when that one comes out, I'll I'll be I'll be probably begging for another interview to talk to you about it. I've actually done a podcast on the issue. It's uh, obviously can't address all of the issues in a podcast, but um, I have podcasts that break down my volumes um, and even go into the books that haven't been published yet. But I only have is that, is that the experience? Is that the Exploring Mormon Thought podcast? It is, yeah. And awesome. that can be found on SoundCloud and iTunes. And, and awesome. I, I've had Spotify. A that's, where I, that's where I listen to is on Spotify. Yeah. I've had a lot of people tell me that they can't understand a word I write, but when I explain it in the podcast, it begins to make some sense. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's part of the reason we had you on here to, today was to kind of break some of this down with you. And even for Hayden and I to act as sort of hopefully some translators to help you know, be the audience that can help to bring this down to the level of people that have normal IQs and uh, not at the level that, that you're at. So anyway, yeah, let's people don't want to be at the level I'm at, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to um, today talk to you a little bit about, um, so Hayden and I have had some conversations with evangelical Christians. We even did a debate at Apologia Church. We've, we've done quite a bit on that front. And we actually had a series of three different podcasts that were two hours each on their podcast talking about all sorts of issues surrounding the nature of God. 
And there was a question that they brought up that Hayden and I were kind of on different sides of the fence, with, right? <laughs> Um, and it was it was this particular question. It's the question of was God always God, right? And yeah. Hayden, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a second to kind of explain what your take is on that question and how you would normally answer that. Sure, I I take the more traditional view, um, maybe more LDS traditional view of God was once a man, and that there is um, a never-ending line of deities who have become what they are today. You know, I, I would qualify that, you know, sometimes when when evangelicals or Protestants ask us, have has God always been God? I think in one sense we could say yes, in that we've all existed forever in some form. But I think what they're really asking is, is God, has he always been the way he is today? And yeah. the answer I would give is no. And which is the opposite, I think, of what Jacob may say. Yeah, and my my take is a little bit different. I I and and I actually am going to move on here to the next part of this and to actually look at something that Joseph Smith said. And and Blake, in your book, you you bring this up. Uh, I believe this is the last chapter of your second volume. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, Joseph Smith said in on February fifth of eighteen forty. This is during the Nauvoo period. This is pretty late in his kind of ministry. He says. I believe that God is eternal, that he has no beginning and can have no end. Eternity means that which is without beginning or end. And then he also says a few years later in the, in the King Follett discourse, he says, we have imagined and supposed that God has been God from all eternity. I will refute that idea. And so you kind of are like, oh, wait a minute. Mm. I'm more on team Joseph 1840 and, uh, and Hayden seems to be more on Team Joseph, eighteen forty four, with the King Follett discourse. Blake, do you want to do you want to offer some of your thoughts on on this apparent contradiction? Yeah, and it's not an apparent contradiction at all um, because he's eternal in different respects. But first, let's begin with evangelicals and the conundrum they fail to even realize that they have. They actually recognize that there was a person who was God who walked around the earth and wasn't fully divine at that time. He was a human being, right? And in the last few chapters of my first volume, I dealt with the issue of Christology, which is the issue of how is Jesus both fully human and fully God. And the earliest councils were all about this issue. They were really struggling with it. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you stop and think about it, it's like God is all-powerful. He's omniscient. Um, he is outside of time. He can't change. But he's also a man who is in time, can change, isn't all powerful, isn't omniscient, and yet this is supposed to be the same person. How do you put those get together, right? And even so, if so the issue, so the issue would be it, it, to them if we were to ask them, was God always God? Yeah. Well, there's kind of an issue where Jesus, at least for a time, wasn't God. So we could say that maybe God wasn't always God because Jesus wasn't always God, right? Yeah. What I want to say is you've got a much larger problem with this issue than we do, and you don't even realize it. And the entire, you know, for at least the first four centuries of the church, they struggled with it. <laughs> I mean, honestly. And so evangelicals seem to me to have a huge blind spot when it comes to this issue because they use it as a gotcha against LDS people, when in fact I don't think that they can give a coherent response at all. Um, and it depends on what you mean by God. And, you know, there are all kinds of different answers in early Christianity. The monophysic view, which means just one nature. God had just one nature. And so his, his divine nature was allowed to include his human nature. And they were kind of both the same nature. There's only one. The Council of Chalcedon came up with rejected Nestorianism, which is the view that God had two separate distinct natures. Chalcedon said he has two natures, but they're so unified that they're they're in one person, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, the and there are a whole bunch of other different pascadism and so forth that that all were different views that renowned theologians in early Christianity had accepted. And so, and so, so the idea is the attributes of this God that they talk about in traditional Christianity all-knowing, all-powerful, outside of space and time, all of these different things. How does that one God and Jesus, how are they the same thing when those attributes contradict one exactly. another? If you look at the man walking around the Palestinian countryside and you say, well, that man is identical to God, 
And that man over there is timeless. He is incorporeal, which means doesn't have a body, and he's all powerful and so forth. And you just say, eh, you keep using those words, and I don't think they mean what you think they mean. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, the and in my opinion, and I've written and, and defended this view at some length, I don't believe that traditional Christianity can give a coherent response to that question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so was God always God? You'd have to say, well, at least with respect to the Son of God, the answer looks like it has to be no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, unless you want to say that he was fully God, and then you get into a, a another um, kind of a, a heresy where where G it's docetism, where Jesus is just considered to be God walking around in a human body or something, um, and ne but never really feels anything because God is impassable; he doesn't feel pain. Yeah. And so, um, you know, he only appeared to suffer, but and this was an early heresy within Christianity because it seemed to be oh. the fall. So to kind of steel man the other side's point of view, they, they're saying that Jesus Christ was the, the God of the Bible. The, you know, he was eternity past prior to his incarnation, was the eternal God of the universe, had all of those attributes. But then wouldn't they say that he shed those attributes that he had to take well, on human form? That's one view of Christology known as kenosis that's used in the in the second chapter of Philippians from a verb that means to empty. So he empties himself of his divine attributes. The problem with that is you can't really say he's divine or God <laughs> if he's emptied himself of those divine attributes. I adopt a modified form of kenosis that is workable within a Mormon framework, definitely not workable within a, a more traditional evangelical, Catholic, um, Presbyterian framework. So... Okay. Um, this is an issue that, uh, so I, I just want to say that if they think that this is a gotcha for Mormons, I don't think they thought very clearly about it. Don't realize the, the real struggles that Christians went through in early Christianity to actually address this kind of an issue. Well, well, they, they would, I mean, just to, again, kind of represent them, but their issue is more, I think, as we look into eternity past, right? So as you look into eternity past, the question is, was God the Father always there, right? Right. Or was he not? Because in Hayden's view, right? In Hayden's view, he wasn't God the Father in eternity past. He became God the Father at some particular point in time. And that, I think, is their distinction. There's a sort of he became, he was, he, God was once a man just like the rest of us. And then at some point he gained his godhood. And they say our God is eternal. And frankly, for me, when I look at the scriptures, I yeah, mean, the scriptures support their case. Yeah. The, the, they don't support us. The, I mean, we, we go to sacrament, we say, God, the eternal father, right. the eternal father. Well, we'd have to parse the word eternal, but when you say he's the same God from everlasting to everlasting, you pretty well say it, don't you? And our yeah. scriptures say that at least four different times, are the unique Mormon scriptures. And so, you know, <clears throat> the idea that, that, and I use the term e eternally backward because that puts us into a, a frame where we're actually talking about God before the world. Mm -hmm. Most Christians would hold that Christ was also eternally backward, preexistent, and, and fully divine as the Son of God. Okay. But with respect to the Father, um, what I want to say is that. The scriptures are very clear, but I think Joseph Smith was equally clear that the son only did what he saw the father do. So mm -hmm. what did the son do? Because he's doing what the father did, right? Okay, so you're saying that that it, if you're going to push back on them, you say, well, Jesus said that he was doing only things that he saw the father do. Like, yeah. what's Jesus talking about then? Yeah, well, and this is also this pushes back both against evangelicals and Hayden just a bit. Okay, <laughs> so. <laughs> The son was fully divine before becoming mortal. Okay. Let that sink in for a moment. Okay. And the question is, how long was he fully divine before becoming mortal? And the answer is backwardly eternally. <laughs> so he then became mortal. And what does that mean? It means, and I make a distinction between mere divinity and a fullness of divinity. So a person gives up the full expression of divine attributes during a time that they're mortal. 
And that's because the full expression of the divine attributes depend upon or contingent upon being in a fully loving relationship with the Father and Holy Ghost from all eternity, right? And so, but one of them, so they deify each other. They, because of their, so, so you're saying that, that they were divine before this life because of a particular kind of relationship that they had with one another, a sort of divine unity between the three of them. Exactly. And they've invited us into the relationship. I see. So, okay. so, so there's a, there's a level of deity there, but what, what we're saying is, so I guess what, what my thing is, is that Hayden would, would say that at some point in time, God became fully divine, but before that he was not. Well, but our scriptures currently say the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are one eternal God from everlasting to everlasting. I mean, they're very clear on this point. Joseph Smith is not in disagreement. I parsed both the King Follett discourse and the Sermon in the Grove in both the last chapter of volume two and in the first chapter of volume three of my books. And what I point out is that Jesus was fully divine before becoming mortal, which means that the Father must have been fully divine before he became mortal because he's doing the same thing. And so the Father was fully divine before becoming mortal as well. The logic of Joseph Smith's use of John 5.22 demands it. So let me, let, me, let me pull something up here. I want to see if I can show this on, uh, on essentially what, what, what's a slide here. Let me see if I can find the slide because I, I tried to sort of look at some of these different models, right, of, sure. of understanding divinity. Uh, so here's time, right? And then right. over time, the classic theist model says, look, God is outside of time. He's one God eternally, always, you know, whole nine yards. And we've talked about that there's problems with that when you look at the fact that Jesus Christ came into the world and how could he be the same person when he didn't have those attributes and anyway, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, time was being clearly could not become anything because becoming something requires there's a moment before it became that and a moment after it. So there's temporal succession. So a temporal being doesn't become anything. Okay. And it's couldn't, the canonic theory of Christology couldn't be adopted because you can't leave behind some, the fullness of some attributes while, while having it, um, others. Okay. Okay. So all of these notions are inconsistent with God being timeless. The, it's a very sophisticated notion, and I would have to get in some very sophisticated arguments. Well, let's 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 leave that at that. But the, the other model here that we're looking at is okay. the infinite regress model that Hayden has talked about. Mm -hmm. But I also want to point out, as we kind of continue through this, um, that hold on one second, let me find it. Okay, so I want to go to this right here. Okay. So. The idea here is that God was eternally in the past, was fully divine, right? He has the crown on everything. He's the, he's the head honcho. He, at some point in time, became mortal sure. and then returned to a higher state, just kind of like how Jesus did. This is sort of the, this is what the father did. And Jesus did this same thing. Is that sort of an accurate representation of the way that you would look at that? Well, it's a simplified representation, but I think it's it's useful for what you're saying. Certainly, God is always progressing. He's always becoming greater. And the question is, what do you do at the time that he's there as a man? Is he divine or not? Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to say God is, is divine from eternity to eternity, you can't slice out a part of eternity where he's not fully divine, right? So you've yeah. got guy flailing his arms. I recognize that this is the ideal man. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> the The bottom line is, is that even as a human being, and this is what I also argue in my third volume, the difference between us and God is that we haven't made the same decisions God did throughout all eternity. And the decision that God made that we didn't make was that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost chose to fully love one another in every moment that they could and for past eternal existence. And that fullness of, of love and unity is what makes them fully divine. However, if there's an overriding reason to leave that unity, and who would do that? I mean, it's the most fulfilling relationship possible. Mm -hmm. If there were some reason that, it's, for instance, salvation for others, <laughs> that required one to leave that unity and thereby to leave 
behind in a sense or to give up the fullness of the expression of the divine attributes for not being in the fullness of that relationship for a time, then a person could become mortal. And in fact, Joseph Smith says that the, the father at one time became mortal, the son at one time became mortal, and the Holy Ghost will someday become mortal. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Holy Ghost is fully divine already right now. It has been for all eternity. So, but, you, but you see them as eternally in the past that they they condescended to come down or will condescend to come down to <laughs> us, but that eternity past, they were fully divine. Now, I want to put up one other little model here on the screen. And this, Hayden, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is sort of the way that I would think you might see it, where from the unorganized intelligences in matter, gods in eternity past pulled up and created man and then man was able to become exalted and become a god. And then they were basically repeated the process. They went and organized matter in eternity and continued this process of creating worlds without end from the unorganized material intelligence of the, of the universe. Is that, Hayden, I, I want to kind of give you the floor for a second to kind of put out your perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, is that sort of the way that you would view it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, you could say that I really subscribe to the King Follett discourse. Um, it, although I'm not married to the idea and I'm willing to be convinced otherwise, um, I, I, I would say that's really where I'm at. And, and I really like that chart. Can you pull that up one more time? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I wanted to say, and, and Blake, tell me what you think about this. Is it fair to say that the word eternal does not always relate to time? Would you agree with that? Yeah, it okay. So, so is it fair to say, well, well, let me, let me ask this question. Do you feel like this model is incompatible, completely incompatible with LDS theology and established, I, I should say established core doctrines? Well, I've got to define core doctrines and establish LDS theology. And I don't believe that either exists. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say as far as you know, the average member would consider what, you know, what the church teaches. I, I, I would concede that I think the average member <clears throat> on the street would probably adopt this reading of the King Follett Discourse. I want to point out one thing. I also fully adopt the King Follett Discourse. I give a hermeneutic, a theory of interpretation, that looks at the King Follett Discourse a little more carefully and concludes that there are a number of assumptions that people bring to the text that make it appear as if though God is, Joseph Smith is saying, that God wasn't God from all eternity, contrary to what he had stated. And that, in fact, what he's stating is that there's a period of time during which God is a human being. That's what he's actually saying. But you'd say that as a matter of course in Mormon, in Mormon thought, even on Jacob's view, in my view, right? And so I parse the King Follett discourse. I also parse the sermon in the grove that he gave a few weeks later, his last public discourse. And look at that and argue that both actually support the view that God is God from all eternity, although he gives up the fullness of his divinity for a time to experience mortality because experience has inherent value. And each of the divine persons has an overriding reason to experience immortality. Okay, so so let me kind of try and see if I understand what you're saying there for the audience's sake. So essentially what you're saying is, is that in the King Follett discourse, a lot of people interpret it as, okay, God was once a man. That means he was a man at, and then he was a man in eternity past. And then at some point in that eternity past, he became, uh, you know, he, he basically started as an intelligence just like the rest of us. And now he's progressed to Godhood where you're saying, no, he was actually God to eternity past, but like Jesus Christ, he condescended at some point for some purpose uh, in order to experience mortality. And so what Joseph is actually saying in the King Follett discourse is that he's not saying that God was a man into eternity past, but he is just merely mentioning the condescension of the father, just like what happened with the son. Exactly. The father also experienced mortality, and that's what he's teaching, he, that Jesus did what the Father did, okay? Now, I think I can bring some light to this. Hayden, if I ask you whether we as human beings have divine nature inherent in us from all eternity, how would you respond to that? 
I would say absolutely. Yeah. So the question then becomes how full is the expression how full does the expression of divine nature have to be to say that we possess divinity? And the answer is, well, we already possess divinity in nature, right? And so I've distinguished between having a mere human or a mere divine nature and a fullness of divine nature. And a fullness of divine nature, by the way, is the same as the fullness of human nature. Okay? <laughs> because God is, Godhood is fully mature humanity. <laughs> and so what Joseph Smith consistently taught, we already have the divine nature and have had it from all eternity past. The intelligences are eternal. They are like God in that respect because God was also an eternal intelligence. And the difference is that we have not, we have not existed in the divine unity and the, uh, the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost from all eternity. But the scriptures are very clear. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost have. <clears throat> and the difference isn't one of nature. They made a different choice than we did. From all eternity, whenever they had the choice to make the, that they could make the choice to love each other, they chose to love each other fully. We didn't make that choice. <clears throat> so the difference isn't a matter of nature. It's a matter of the accidents of the choices that we make. And by an accident, I, mean, I simply mean something that could be different, right? So the difference between us and God is a matter of the choices and consequences of our choices. It's not our divine nature, which we already possess. And we, we didn't make the choice to be in the relationship, but they did. So from all eternity, prior to becoming human, they were fully divine. However, they left the fullness of that unity. They left the fullness of divinity in, in the terms of, of uh, Philippians. Christ emptied himself of the fullness of his divinity mm -hmm. to become a human being. And so during that time, Christ was merely divine, but not fully divine. Okay. So by merely, let, let's talk about that for a minute. So merely divine means, um, I, I guess, yeah. Where's the line between merely divine and fully divine? So we possess all of the divine properties, but not to their fullness, to their, in their fullness or to their fullest. So I have knowledge, but I don't have a fullness of knowledge. I have I power, see. but I don't have a fullness of power. Okay, so I have these, and and so some of these properties I have in potentiality, but it's still a divine property. To have rationality is a divine property. So then, would you say that we all have mere divinity? Absolutely. It's okay, I see. In human beings to be of divine nature. Now, what actualizes our divine nature is when we choose to love one another. When we choose to love one another as Jesus loved us. As I said before, we've been invited into this relationship, right? And when I we see. enter into the relationship, we will be everything that they are, without exception. We will. So the idea is, is that we have these properties of divinity, but through covenant, they are inviting us into the unified relationship that allows for, let's say, full divinity, because we accept and then enter into that proper relationship with them and with one another. Yeah, we, the relationship deifies us, just as it exalts God. I mean, um, Christ said that he had glorified the Father, and the, the Father, that the Father had glorified him. They mutually glorify each other. Mm -hmm. Well, we're glorified, we, we seek to glorify God as well. However minimal, you know, our, our contribution to God's glory that's what we seek to do. We want to increase his glory and increase the light that he has. But we all, by doing so, we grow in the light ourselves until we have a fullness of light. So there are some very, you know, there are common technical terms, and one of them is fullness, um, you know, the pleroma in Greek. And so the Doctrine and Covenants uses the term of fullness of divinity <laughs> and a fullness of, of, you know, so what Christ lacked when he was human was a fullness. And when he became fully divine, he had a fullness of divinity. Wow. And then in section 93, he turns around and says, you also, and then he talks about us receiving a fullness of divinity just as he has it. I give a chart comparing DNC 93 um, and, and show that what everything that's true of Jesus, he says is also true of us. Okay. Mm -hmm. so 
exist like Jesus and the Father and the Holy Ghost. We've all existed from all eternity as individuals. The difference in our status is that, is that we haven't chosen to fully love in each moment where we could. And so he's inviting us and teaching us how to love. The purpose of life is to come here so that we can learn how to love each other fully, so that we can fully participate in the divine relationship and participate in the fullness of everything that God has. And that is that is what we might call the celestial order. Is exactly. that, that in like love looks like the order of the celestial relationship? Exactly. The unity that that creates Zion <laughs> is is a loving relationship. And there's you know. We talk about the list of things that we do to show that we love each other. We don't steal from each other. We don't kill each other, etc. That's an animal world. But if we love each other, we also take the coat off of our own backs and put it on the person that we love when they're cold. When they ask us for directions, we don't merely point. We walk the full mile with them to show them where it is. Yeah. And so what Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount is the is how to be a is fully realizing how to love each other in a way that God loves us to love as he loved us. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that this is really the center of Joseph Smith's theology and everything that he put together all the way from the concept of Zion to, to the concept of, of exaltation. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, it's this notion of having a relationship such that we demonstrate our love for each other fully and in so doing, we glorify each other and we're fully glorified in God. We share fully in his glory and everything that he, when I say everything that he is, I mean, all the knowledge that he has, we possess all the power he has, we possess. And the entire, all of our, all of our potentialities are, realized to their fullest. No, because there's no fullest. We will continue to grow for all eternity. <laughs> I see and that, that no, and that, that, that does make sense. Now, now real quick, I want to go back to the King Follett discourse okay. because I know Hayden, this is, what's interesting is this, is that if you actually look at our canonical scriptures, the whole idea is that God has got into eternity past. Okay. That's kind of the, everything in the scripture says that, but the King Follett discourse and the sermon on the grove drop this sort of depth charge of, Hey, God was once a man. And now there's all these ideas that spin around that. Now, there's something though interesting that you point out in the King Follett discourse in your book that I that I was very interested in. And it was sort of this idea of the head God and how Joseph Smith talks about essentially a father of all other gods. T tell me a little bit about why that's important and why that matters. What Joseph Smith is doing here is recreating the ancient Hebrew view of heaven and the, and how it's populated by the gods okay when he talks about the head god he's talking about a god who presides over all of the other deities the sons of god if you will the bini mm -hmm. and so what joseph smith is teaching us there there is such a head god the eternal god of all other gods it's how it's expressed in dnc 121 right <laughs> so um the scriptural term is that there is a god who is preeminent over all other gods. And Joseph Smith understood that God to be the father of Jesus well, Christ. And I'm going to, I want to throw something to Hayden then. Hayden, what do you make of this idea of a head God? I mean, if there's a head God in an infinite regress, there's no head God per se that started the chain. Mm -hmm. It's an eternal thing. Is there any sort well, of a, a thought well, that you have on that? Sure. My, my question would be, what's your guys's interpretation of when Joseph says there's, no beginning and there's no end. So, and I kind of, my question, and maybe I'm, I'm kind of drawing from my interpretation of the King Follett discourse. And maybe I'm doing exactly what like you're saying is I'm injecting assumptions in regards to, right. Cause it kind of sounds like in the King Follett discourse, can it can actually, can I read a little paragraph yeah, for me, yeah. especially for viewers who, who've never read it. Um, let me see the best place to speak from. He says, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. And if I will, yeah, let's see if this is the best place to go. No, then he talks about, okay, let me, let me go down here. 
He says, what did Jesus do? Why I do the things I saw my father do when the worlds came rolling into existence. My father worked out his kingdom with fear and trembling, and I must do the same. And when I get my kingdom, I shall present it to my father so he may obtain kingdom upon kingdom and will exalt him in glory and it will exalt him in glory. He will, he will then take a higher exaltation and I will take his place and thereby becoming exalted myself so that Jesus treads in the tracks of his father and inherits what God did before. God is thus glorified and exalted in the salvation and exaltation of all his children. It is plain to be uh, plain beyond uh, disputation, right? So my question is, and, and maybe I'm realizing my own assumptions now, when he talks about seeing what God did before him, maybe I'm inserting myself into, into Jesus Christ, not as a savior, but as a son of God. If God did this before, does it not then follow that God was, as you said, an intelligence brought up as we were, right? It's almost like he's an introducing. And so, so there's, so there's a tension though here, because mm -hmm. in, in this, there, in the King Follett discourse, we have two things. On one hand, we have the idea that, that uh, of, of what you were just talking about, Hayden, that kind of that that God was once like man went through the the experiences that we went through, but then there's the other thing of there's an idea of a head God, a God, a Father of all kind of fathers essentially, mm -hmm. and so there's a tension there. Mm -hmm. um, so so let's let's uh, I'm what, bring in. Oh, well, go ahead. Can, can I just ask? Is there um, a specific quote from Joseph or from? You know somebody, or 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 how did where did that idea come from? I guess is my question. Well, the head God, head head God, yeah. In both the King Follett discourse and also the Sermon on the Grove, Joseph Smith repeatedly talks about the head God. In okay. fact, he he translates Genesis one one and says that what it means is the head God brought forth the other gods, and that's the basis of the entire sermon. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, yes, I do see that. Okay. So, what? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go, I apologize. Go ahead. No. So in, inherent in this view and what Joseph Smith is actually saying is, is there is eternal progression where we mutually glorify one another. And when God, when God has exalted us, our exaltation mutually exalts him even higher than he is. We mutually exalt each other. However, his glory won't be any greater than ours because we're mutually glorifying each other. It's just that we're all glorifying growing in the light without limit there's an eternal progression and there are vistas and worlds beyond okay so the what joseph smith is teaching as i take it is what you know jesus was teaching in john 14 through 17 this kind of mutual glorification and god just as as jesus glorified the father and the Father was made even greater by that glory. So the same glory is given to the disciples in right in John 17. It's not as if the fact that, that God is growing in, in glory means that he began at zero, okay, which I think is the assumption you're beginning from. It doesn't mean that he started at one and then he's he's reached infinity, which you couldn't do by counting one to two anyway. So bottom line is. We start with full divine nature, okay? And we're what we are is is we are perfecting this nature for all eternity because perfection isn't a static notion. It's not perfection is not like a game of golf where the maximum best score is 18. That's the best you can do. That's perfection in golf. Yeah. It's, you know, the greatest number of home runs that you could hit. And the fact is there's no limit on the number of home runs you can hit. The number is infinite, <laughs> okay? Um, exaltation is is more like that. It's not a game of golf. So, so go ahead. So, real quick, Hayden, you had talked about the the, the King Follett discourse and, and if it had talked about this. And I'm actually quoting from your book now, Blake. Sure. Um, you write that in the King Follett discourse, to, uh, discourse uh, he had taught, speaking of Joseph Smith, that, quote, the only true God spoken of in John 17, 3, is the quote, this is from the King Follett Discourse, the head, the father of the gods. In the beginning, the head of the gods called a council of gods, and they came together and concocted a plan to create the world and people it. And what's interesting is, is that not only is the idea of the, the father god, 
the 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 one at the beginning of the chain present in the King Follett discourse, which is not canonical scripture, by the way. Um, it is in our canonical scripture in Doctrine and Covenants uh, uh, 121 32 says that which was ordained in the midst of the council of the eternal God of all other gods before the world was. There is a consistent theme in the Old Testament, in the Doctrine and Covenants, in the King Follett discourse itself, that all seem to point to a, a, a different notion. This notion of, and I'm going to put it here on the screen, uh, let me just pull it up here, um, of of a head god or something that that is referred to as monarchical monotheism sort of this and I Blake I'm not sure if you made up that term or, or or if it comes from somewhere else but but it's the idea that yeah there may be gods that are that come about later people attain or enter into this same relationship with god but it all goes back to this eternal head god why he's got the crown on his head, the, the king of all the other gods, the, the father from which all the rest come. So it's not an infinite regress backwards, though moving forward, we may say that that is an, an, inc uh, an infinite increase uh, e eternally. Now, I'm going to real quick throw this to Blake. Blake, does this is this a fair representation of sort of what monarchical monotheism would sort of look like? Yeah, I would call it monarchical monotheism. But monarchical. Okay, I probably messed that up. <laughs> kind of a scholarly term for the view in the Old Testament that recognizes a council of gods. Because you have El, the Father God, who is the God who presides in, in the council of gods. <clears throat> Yahweh is one of his sons, if you want to get technical, okay? And... The, the bottom line is is that the, there's this God who is recognized as the father of the gods and the sons of God, the Beni Elohim, recognized, as I said, in the Old Testament. And it's a consistent theme. It's also, by the way, in the book of Abraham where it talks about an intelligence that is more intelligent than all of the other intelligences. Um, this is in, in book of Abraham 3.22, I think. And so we have a God who is more intelligent than all of the others. And he is the one who is bringing all of the others. That's why Jesus always gives glory to the Father, always recognizes and says that he is, he doesn't say he's inferior to the Father. He says the Father is greater than I, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. And so um, the the bottom line is that, that Christ believed that his Father um, was preeminent. And throughout Mormon scripture, the Father is seen as the source of divinity. He's seen as the preeminent deity to which all of the others give worship and obeisance. And so this is, you know, it's it, it's also what I suggest that Joseph Smith is teaching again in the King Follett Discourse and the Sermon in the Grove. As you mentioned, they're not canonical, but the Book of Abraham, the Doctrine and Covenants in the Old Testament, and I have argued this view also exists in the New Testament. It's recognizable, and certainly in the Dead Sea Scrolls, <laughs> places like that. Um, it's a very consistent view. And so um, it, it, it brings Joseph Smith's thought into alignment with the revelations that he received and, and with the entire history, I would suggest, of Scripture. Um, so could, could I jump in on there on, on the uh... – the, the consistency here with scripture, because some people, especially uh, a Christian listener who's listened to this is like, what are you talking about? Go read Isaiah. You know, it's, it, it, you know, there's, there's one God. You guys are talking about this plurality of gods. You guys are being unbiblical and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pull up here on the screen. You know, one of the ones that they love to show, you know, is, is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any Isaiah, you know, 44, eight, but what, what you're pointing out and I, is something that I think uh, is being pointed out more and more in biblical scholarship these days is, is this idea of the council of the gods. And, and I wanted to share uh, a, I, a video yeah, with, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Blake. Yeah, this is a recognized taunt by a king in the, in the ancient Near East. And, and the kind of taunt that we find inscribed is, is there a king beside me? There is no other king. I know not of any. We, we find that exact inscription, but, there are kings throughout the ancient Near East. What he's saying is, I'm the head king, I'm the real dude, and you, you, unless you recognize me, you're not recognizing the proper king. So yeah. that's 
kind of thing that's really happening in Isaiah. I just wanted to add that. No, 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 absolutely. And I agree. It's it's this statement of incomparability right. rather than non-existence of someone else. And 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 Michael Heiser, uh, who we're gonna go to now, he's a biblical scholar, not a member of the church. And you know, and and I'd imagine that he's not the only scholar out there that recognizes that if you actually dig into the history of the, the Bible and its actual text uh, and do that textual criticism, you will find that the polytheism is all over the, the Old Testament. So I want to just throw this up real quick and uh, and let the audience watch it. And then uh, we can stop it. If you want to make a comment, just, uh, just let me know here. In Psalm 82, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, is said to hold judgment over other gods. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Psalm 82 becomes very interesting if you learn a little Hebrew. The word most often translated God or gods in the Old Testament is Elohim. Watch what happens when we reveal where that word is used in this passage. Notice that both the capital G, God, and the lowercase g, gods were changed. That is because the word Elohim can be used for several different things. The context of the passage tells us what Elohim is referring to. The Bible's writers use Elohim as an alternate name for Yahweh over a thousand times, but Elohim can also refer to the gods of foreign nations or demons, spirits of the human dead, and angels, most likely the angel of the Lord. As you can see, these are all inhabitants of the spiritual realm. It should be clear from this list that not all Elohim were considered equal. While Yahweh is an Elohim, the writers of the Bible considered him unique and far above the others. The ancient Israelites thought of the spiritual world as a three-tiered hierarchy with God at the top. It may surprise many Christians to learn that angels are actually on the lowest tier of the hierarchy. The Hebrew word for angel, malach, is basically a job description used to denote a spirit being who carries out modest tasks, like delivering messages. The tier above the angels is occupied by beings called B'nai Elohim in Hebrew. B'nai Elohim is usually translated sons of God in English Bibles. And when most people read that phrase, they are not even aware it refers to spiritual beings. But as we will see, the sons of God played an important role in the Old Testament. In the beginning of the book of Job, there is a meeting of God's court or council. Guess who is there? Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, a term that means adversary, also came among them. The sons of God do not only show up in God's throne room. Later in Job, we see that the sons of God were present at creation. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me. If you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. We can see that the sons of God were important figures. So I'm going to stop it right there. And, uh, my thing when I first saw that video was, holy smokes, Joseph Smith was ahead of the game, <laughs> you know? Uh, Blake, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, is that your understanding of, of these things as a, as a biblical scholar yourself? Oh, Blake, uh, I think you're muted. I turned it off so you wouldn't hear me coughing and wheezing. So... <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, in my third volume, I recreate the Hebrew um, divine council, if you will. I show how it arises from the earlier Ugaritic um, and other ancient Near Eastern civilizations, how they had a common concept, and then show how it, it persisted 
throughout the Old Testament. I mean, throughout the entire Old Testament. And how there was... Well, I've, I've been, ever since I watched that video, whenever I see the term sons of God used, I like perk up. I'm like, wait a minute. There's more to that saying than I originally thought. So yeah. just, to, just to clarify, are you guys saying the sons of God are us? Sons and daughters, I guess? Oh, that's in fact, Joe, Jesus quotes the very psalm that was just read to us. And he says, are you not gods? That's Psalm 82 he's quoting. And yeah, it's that's, a, that's a mind blower when you understand all this, what yeah. he's saying. I, I mean, you know, the answer by the Jews was, what the, are you talking about, <laughs> right? And he meant it. And it's like, no. The answer that they're going to give is no. The answer that Christ is inferring is, of course. Yeah. So I'm saying that we're all sons of God. We're all, you know, except for those who are female and they're daughters of God. And I'm saying that we are, we have eternal divine nature, something that you've already, you know, recognized exists in us, right? To have a divine nature means that we participate in God's nature. And we do that because we're sons and daughters of God. So just to clarify for me and those who are listening, probably for most people watching, this is going to be their first time considering this concept. Are you saying that you believe that the head God, and can you, uh, Jacob, do you have that picture of the yeah. the head God and then the last one that you showed with the crown? Yeah, hold on. Let me pull it up here and we'll get it on the screen. This is going to be helpful just to clarify. Okay, hold on. Let me get it. It's right here. Okay, perfect. So, Blake, are you saying that you believe that the Heavenly Father that we pray to is the God all the way on the left? Is that right? The God that we pray to is the Father in the name of the Son by the power of the Holy Ghost, yes. Okay. So, so that, that would be that would be the God on the far left. The the, the eternal father, the the, mm -hmm. the the head of the ground council, is that correct? Yeah, except for I would say there are actually two concepts. One is that the Godhead itself is the eternal reality, right? And so what I want to say is that what we're dealing with is actually the, the notion that we have divine beings who are related to one another. They've existed in relationship for all eternity. And there are three who are distinguished from us because of the kind of loving decisions that they made in relation to each other from all eternity, okay? We have the potential to be everything that they are because we have the same nature. But we have to learn to love in the way that they love before we can do that. We are the sons of God. Now, in my third volume, I show that, for instance, the, the story of the creation of man and, and the, some of the Psalms actually are teaching that man is replacing of the gods. Adam comes down and he is given dominion, which had previously been had by the sons of God. Okay. In fact, what Psalm 82 is teaching us is the sons of God have not done what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to take care and, and they're actually viewed as the gods of other nations, if you will. Okay. And God is deposing them. He's saying, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. You did not take care of the poor and needy. And so you are going to fall like Adam fell, and you are going to experience immortality. He expressly said what he's teaching is that they're going to become mortal. The sons of God are going to learn how to love one another. <laughs> <laughs> learn how to love more fully is what, what Psalm 82 is actually teaching us, and that's what the trial in Psalm 82 is about. Could I could I could I offer a, a quick thought here, and then Hayden will we'll give you will give you the floor. Um, I want to actually put on here another sort of model the way I see it. Okay, this is my try and 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 sort of reconcile the two models is that you have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who who act as let's say quote unquote one God, meaning the 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 loving triune relationship that we are invited to enter and join into, and they have uh, jointly you know created this world. Um, and now have invited us up into that relationship so that we too, like them, can assist others in doing the same thing, something like that. And that can continue and expand eternally as sort of a, a, a notion of eternal increase. Real quick, um, I want to give the floor though to Hayden before I, I, I get more thoughts on that. Just, just well, I just Hayden, have you want to any thoughts? I just have a lot of questions. So just just to clarify, are you saying so where it says unorganized matter and intelligence, Blake, you would say that 
even the Godhead was there, but they were more intelligent than us and they loved from the beginning. Yeah, they had they were free beings like all of us. They had a choice. And the choice was whether they would choose to fully love one another. They made a choice in every moment of eternity that they could make that choice. And that's every moment of eternity. Okay. We, however, have not learned to fully love in that way. They have the capacity, maybe because they were more intelligent, maybe because of the, you know, but some intelligences are more intelligent than others. That's what we learned from the book of Abraham, right? These three were preeminently intelligent. And what mortality is about is teaching us to be as they are by learning to love. And so he gives us all these commandments, which are summarized in just one commandment. It's very simple. There's only one commandment when it's all boiled down. It's love one another as I love you. And so we're here to learn to love as they do so that we can be fully exalted and be everything that they are because we are of the same nature. And we could have been just as they are if we'd made the same choice, but we didn't. Okay, and and it could be because we were less intelligent. Maybe maybe we were as intelligent and we were just stubborn, or maybe maybe we chose to be stupid. Very intelligent people can choose to do stupid things. Okay, so the difference is one of choice, not one of nature. And the from all eternity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost have been in relation, except for a period in which each of the divine persons chooses to leave that unity and leave behind the fullness of the expression of their divine properties so that they can experience immortality. They can experience what it's like to be human because there, there are a lot of, uh, there's only one way to gain experiential knowledge and that's through experience. Okay. You're saying the Holy ghost also, you believe yeah, received the body. We taught on at least three occasions that the Holy ghost would one day become embodied. Okay. Would or, or has, has no. already. Okay. Would. Yeah, people who teach these already become embodied. I regard as heretics, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but he he taught on at least three occasions that the Holy Ghost would one day become embodied as well. So we see the kind of uh, process: the Father was fully divine, became embodied; the Son was fully divine, left behind his glory, and became human. The Holy Ghost is fully divine. One day he will become human. Now is the time that we are leaving behind our prior glory and being at least in the presence of our Father and given the opportunity to choose to be as he is by learning to love and and choosing to love. The key concept here is that if love is to exist at all, it has to be a free choice. Can't be coerced. Can't be a matter of nature. I don't just love because I'm a human being. And it's something that has to be a full hearted choice. And some of us have to learn how to love one another. I use the analogy of, of the, I, I'm sure you've seen Groundhog Day, right? Mm-hmm. So what, what's Phil's last name? He comes into Punxsutawney. He hates everybody. He hates life. He goes through life thousands and thousands of times. He finally gets sick of himself and tries to kill himself because repeating the same thing over and over again is so darn boring and worthless. But then he learns something. He begins to make something of himself, and he devotes his entire day to making the life of the townspeople better. And he begins to grow as a person. And finally, he's to the point where the the last line in Groundhog Day is, I love it here. Let's live here. (laughs) (laughs) He's learned to love the people, and that's how he got to move on. When he learned to love, he became unstuck. And we're the very same way. It's called repentance. When we learn to love, we get to move on, and until then, we're stuck. And so the bottom line is that that God has set up a plan for us to be what he is and to give us everything that he has. And it's, it's not that complicated. It's love one another as I have loved you. And enter into that relationship that they have had for eternity past exactly. that we can join into. And so, um, Hayden, as we're getting down to some of the last bit here, if you have a couple of questions you want to you want to mm-hmm. do here to kind of finish yeah, up this, just just a couple, and I'm sure we could talk about this for another hour, um, which we won't, I guess. So help me understand: before God got became embodied, you would say that He was equivalent to like a spirit. A spirit body? 
there's a complication here. Joseph Smith used the term intelligence and spirit interchangeably. Okay. Right. I read an article about this. <laughs> and so I don't believe there was a stage before which we were spirits. We are eternally spirits. And and we the, didn't come from anywhere. We just are. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Okay. It's nature to exist as the individuals that we are. And that's what it means to be an intelligence, okay? Now, exactly what an intelligence is, is, uh, I would say, not not pellucidly clear, but clear enough. Intelligence is somebody who can make choices. That's That expresses intelligence, okay? And we've had an eternity before getting here to make choices. But sometimes we grow and sometimes we regress and sometimes... But the whole point is, is we're, we have this entire vista eternally of new experiences and new opportunities. And we're here in particular, and this is not scriptural, maybe it is, but I don't know where it is. I think we live on a particularly heinous planet, one that is a huge challenge to goodness. And the people who come here have taken on a huge challenge, if you will, a huge stretch. <laughs> and so this is the planet that actually killed the Savior. And... The person who expressed the greatest love conceivable was rejected and hung on a Roman cross and died a horrific death, okay? Something more painful than that. I mean, I don't think there exists anything more painful than that. It's horrific. And yet this was the man who expressed his fullness of divinity by forgiving the people who did that to him. And he did something really unusual. He came back, okay? And he's opened the door for us to come back so that we can come back glorified and resurrected in a way that we haven't existed previously. Not everybody was forced, however, to come here. God, I think, essentially went to the intelligence of spirits and said, I really desire further relationship with you. I want you to be everything that I am. and I have a plan for that to happen. But in order for you to be what I am, you must learn to love one another first. And the only way to love one another is to be in a situation where you're genuinely challenged to not like people and where you have a genuine, full-throated, free choice to not love if you choose not to. And so, but the upside is so great. This is a real endeavor. It's not sure to be, well, will you join me in this endeavor? And the majority said, you betcha. <laughs> and some people looked around and said, you know, I'm happy the way I am. I don't need that. I'm not ready yet, yet. <laughs> Maybe someday I will be, but yeah, not my project right now. And God honored their choice. See, I see the war in heaven is basically the expression that God is honoring those who are not choosing to move on at this point. Mm -hmm. And it's every choice we make as well, because life is about those kinds of choices. So, I mean, Joseph Smith's vision and vista and how it puts together the scriptures is so inspiring to me. And it's all focused on love. It's all focused on our Savior as the one who opens the door for us to move into our next next degree of light and glory. Yeah, let me let me see, you know, as we kind of wind this down, I know, Hayden, you probably have more questions, but I think we're going to move on to, to the next topic. Um, and I think we'll break this up into, into two episodes here. But to kind of wrap this one up, I just want to see, make sure that I understand, uh, Blake, kind of what, j just kind of sum this up. So the idea is, okay, has God always been God? Well, we would say that, or, or your view here is, is that God has been God in eternity past. That is true. But at some point in that process, he did condescend and and have a, a mortal experience. So when Joseph Smith and the King Follett Discord or in the Sermon on the Grove is talking about those, those are references to that mortal experience that the Father had. And that we um, are in a mortal experience with the potentiality to join him and Jesus Christ in the unity that it talks about in John 17, this, this perfect oneness uh, with one another to enter into that relationship. And it is through Jesus Christ that that is possible. And it is indeed all about love at the end of the day. If we truly love and care about one another and treat each other in accordance with the celestial law, which is sort of the, the blueprint for how what love looks like, that then we are able to enter into the kind of life eternally that they have. 
And so that is sort of the the model that you have have laid out in your book. Is that is that a fairly good summation of it? Yeah, I'd say that's accurate as far as it goes. That's you know, and in fact, in my second volume, I lay out a, a, a theory of ethics. It's an agape theory of ethics. Agape is the is the Greek word for love, and so. Uh, you know, even the ethics is based upon love, essentially. And so what we're here about, and, and we've existed from all eternity past. We've had a fullness of divine nature um, available to us. We simply haven't chosen to avail ourselves of it. Yeah. <laughs> they have been fully divine from all nature and have availed themselves of it because they made the choice to fully love one another. And now they're teaching us and setting it up so that we can learn how to love as they love. And so, and, and Christ is, is the model, right? He yeah. said, love as I've shown you how to love each other. And that's great. It's even more I, Christ turned the key so that we can be resurrected and take on an additional exalted nature through his resurrection. So can I ask one final question amongst yeah, many that I have, can you help me understand with your model of, of God being God forever and, and condescending. And I'm assuming you don't make any claims about what he did while he was man. You don't, there's no, I mean, would you, is, would you say anything about his mortal experience? Yeah. Well, uh, I assume, I assumed he messed his pants when he was a kid and that he blew his nose. So, so you do believe he lived like, like we do like with, with the human population. Yeah. I, I think he, whether on this planet or another planet, I, I believe that the father, did what we saw Christ do because that's what Christ said he did. <laughs> Can I help me understand where did the people that he lived with come from? Were they also his children or other intelligences or? Yeah, they were part of the, like the, he was, they were part of the Bene Elohim that we saw. They were those who chose to have an experience. And so know, there are other gods on his level who loved as he did. No, not on his level. He's preeminent, right? The father. Okay. Um, and I don't know what you mean by love. We'd have to parse that carefully, actually, to make sense of it. I mean, I mean, you say he loved from f forever, right? I mean, those people that he lived with in his mortal experience, did they also love from from forever? Okay, they did not. No, they did. And I, I think that Joseph Smith has answered the question. There's another question, and I think what Joseph Smith realized is, well, we have a conundrum, <clears throat> and the father becomes divine who's ruling the universe <laughs> okay and the answer is <clears throat> um the father the, the son and the holy ghost still are in a unity in our divinity right yeah. um and so he's talking about the father of the father <laughs> and, how, and that's the issue he's addressing because he realizes there's a conundrum there who's you know if, you're, if god kind of and you're talking about the father of the father like in the if we were to look at like the sermon in the grove, that's you're saying that referring to it like a mortal father, not to an, exactly. an eternal father, like 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 I, his Joseph kind of. Has, there has to still be a God in charge, and if he's going to be born, he has to have a father, right? <laughs> he wasn't immaculately conceived, in other words. Okay, Jesus was immaculately conceived in some sense, um, in the sense that God the Father is directly Jesus's father. Uh, at least that's that's what the Gospels of Matthew and Luke teach, and so does the Book of Mormon very clearly, right? Yes. So, um, but I would I would parse that differently. I think than most Mormons and most classical Christians. Um, so, in, in any event, yes, the the Father was on a planet, and he was there with schlocks like us, and he had a mortal father and mother. Yes. Okay. Who were his children? Were they considered his children as like my parents are my siblings type of a deal? Like they're my spirit siblings, right? Was he a father and had children? Yeah, I, I presume that he did. Now, no, no, I mean, I mean his his mortal parents. What was his eternal relationship with his mortal parents? Yeah, well, we don't have a lot of information on that, but I would right. guess that when he was a teenager, it was stressed, and when he was a little little boy, they adored him. And well, I, I I apologize. I don't mean like within mortality. I mean, did they have a, a what was their relationship before they were all born? Oh no, they were Ben Elohim. Remember, so they were still, all there in the council. So they are still less intelligent than he is. 
Yeah, in the sense that they haven't fully chosen to love and learn what it is to be fully divine. Okay. They're, and, they're, and, well. Okay, and here's really what my question was leading up to. How do you square that with there being a final judgment? Um, or or do you believe that after final judgment, do you believe in progression between kingdoms? Or why would he, you know, who decided there needed to be a final judgment? If he's just another intelligence that we are that he's trying to help us, why cut it off and say, okay, you guys are going to outer darkness forever. You guys are going here. Or I guess they're choosing it. We could say, right. Why is there a, fi is there a final cutoff or is there a, a, not really a cutoff? No, we're not playing golf. We're playing infinite baseball. And so we have eternal vistas as Joseph Smith taught, and there's no end to his kingdoms and there's no end to his worlds and there's no end to the experiences we can have and the growth that we can make and, and, and experiences that, you know, I, I would say it's inherently valuable, but there's no limit to the kinds of experiences we can have. And we have an eternity in which to do it. And so this is a pretty exciting prospect. If you stop and think about it, <laughs> um, the, I, I think the bottom line that you're looking for is, you know, is the final judgment actually final or is there something yeah. beyond it? Right. That's it. I'm not sure the word finals in the scripture, but, um, there is a, what I would call a final assessment of this life. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think we do it for ourselves. I think we'll know immediately where we are and we're, we're our own judges as, as it says in the book of Alma, you know, and so, as actually Lehi said that we are our own judges. And I, I believe that there will be some who would rather feign the rocks would crash upon them and hide them from God than be in the presence of God. And they'll make the choice not to be in his presence. And there will be some that are so delighted to be in his presence that they'll break out singing joyfully because they can't, you know, they can't restrain themselves from it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the bottom line is that we're, wherever we are, God accepts us. And wherever we are is the point at which we either grow or we don't, or we regress. <laughs> okay. And this is going on eternally. Um, and, you know, the, the issue comes up. I, I suggest that Mormonism is kind of a universal salvation to begin with, that all are saved except for their sons of perdition. And my view is that God will never give up on them. The problem is they're so darn stubborn, they won't reach out and nobody can reach in to get them. So. <laughs> Jacob, I have one, I apologize, one last question and we'll be done. Because I have, well, here's my final one. Do you believe that you are going to do what God is currently doing? Do you believe that you will be an intelligence and all powerful and, and have all knowledge? And we're going to talk about that in a second. And then you're going to be helping the intelligences to become like, are you joining this infinite game? Yeah. Okay. And I, I do it through, through temple work. I do it by offering the ordinances of salvation in this life. And but as an exalted being, I mean, like what's your work as an exalted being? Yeah, of course I will join God in the fullness of his exaltation as, as we all are invited to do. And we will assist him in yet further vistas and plans to, to plan further growth. And for their opportunities. And do you believe that you will have a son equivalent to a Jesus Christ on an earth? No. Okay. One savior, and that's sufficient. Interesting. Okay. And when you help these intelligences, they're not praying to you. Are you going to become their well are they to you? careful about prayer? There's no way to pray to the Father without including the Son and the Holy Ghost, right? Mm -hmm. When we're all powerful, everything that they know, we will know. Everything they do, we will fully agree with. And in a sense, we will also do because we're in full agreement with every action, right? Um, and so there will be a unity such that everything that is done is done in unison. Um, and though there are philosophical issues involved in that. I address them in my, in my third volume. But the, the bottom line is, just as Christ says in the New Testament repeatedly, we will inherit everything that the Father has. We will be everything that the Father is if we learn to love as he loved us. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and hit the subscribe button. Also, if you want more content, including the podcast, go to thoughtful-faith.com. Thanks for watching.